Good morning and welcome to the March 16th Board of County Commissioners meeting. I am Kate Flavin, Interim Public Information Officer. Commissioners, I'd like to remind you and everyone to sign up for your monthly newsletter to be sent out this March, uh, by the end of this month, and you can go to our website, www.sedgwickcounty.org, and click on this handy little infographic here to fill in the information and select which newsletters you would like to receive. And with that, I'll let you start your meeting. All right. Well, thank you, Kate. appreciate you uh, introdu introducing the meeting this morning. I will go ahead and call to order the regular business meeting for the Board of County Commissioners for the month of April the 16th, 2016. Madam Clerk, first item, please. Invocation to be led by Reverend Sherdell Brethett, Sr., St. Mark United Methodist Church. Please remain standing for the flag salute. Good morning, Commissioners. Let's just pray. God, we pause this moment just to say thank you. Thank you for this beautiful day and the weather. We thank you for your presence. Your word is very clear in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust the Lord with all of our heart. Lean not to our own understanding, but in all of our ways to acknowledge you. You promise to direct our path. God, we're needing your direction. We need your guidance. Be with this commission as they make decisions, God, that impact this community, this city, this county, this region. And God, may you get all the glory, all the honor, and the praise. In Christ Jesus' strong name, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Reverend Breath, thank you so much for the prayer this morning. I appreciate you uh, coming and encouraging our hearts this morning. Um, Madam Clerk, next item, please. Roll call. <coughs> Commissioner Unruh. Present. Commissioner Norton. Present. Commissioner Peter John. Present. Commissioner Ranza. Present. Chairman Howell. Present. All right. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Public agenda. <coughs> Do we have anybody signed up to speak this morning? All right. Seeing none, we will go ahead and go on to the next item, please. Proclamations. Item A. Proclamation welcoming <coughs> Alpha Kappa Alpha <coughs> Sorority 86th Midwestern Region Conference. <coughs> All right, Commissioners, I do have a proclamation to read, and uh, is Miss Joy Barnes here this morning? Very good. Uh, I'll go ahead and read this, and uh, we'll present this to you in just a moment. It says, whereas members of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and Midwestern Region, which includes the local Beta Kappa Omega and Epsilon Alpha chapters of Wichita, are hosting the 86th Midwestern Regional Conference on March the 16th through the 20th, 2016, and whereas the regional conference convenes several hundred members of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority from the states of Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Iowa, Colorado, Montana, and Wyoming, the conference is an opportunity to showcase how members of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority use leadership skills through service to improve the quality of life for all mankind. And whereas the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority is an international service organization, <clears throat> Founded in 1908 on the campus of Howard University in Washington, D.C., it is the oldest Greek letter organization established by African-American college-educated women. And whereas Alpha Kappa Alpha's mission is to cultivate and to encourage scholastic and ethical standards to study and help alleviate issues negatively impacting local communities and to be of service to all mankind, and whereas Sedgwick County is honored to have Midwestern Regional Conference in our community this year, and we thank members of the Alpha, Cal Alpha Kappa Alpha and the Midwestern region for their commitment to service and to the advancement of girls and women. Now, therefore, be resolved that I, Jim Howell, Chairman of the Sedgwick County Commission, uh, do hereby welcome members of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority to Sedgwick County for the 86th, Mid 86th Midwestern Regional Conference in Sedgwick County, and I call this observance to the attendance of our citizens. Commissioners, what's the will of the board? I move we adopt the proclamation. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. And... Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Commissioner Unruh. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Peter John. Aye. Commissioner Ranza. Aye. Chairman Howell. Aye. And of course, Ms. Barnes is here to receive that. And I'd like to say something real quickly. Yes, real quick. I just wanted to thank the um, commissioners and the council for 
request, I mean, for giving us this proclamation. Um, the conference actually kicks off tomorrow, and so this, the streets will be painted with pink and green with over 600 women within the Midwestern region, so we're just happy to have it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Barnes, for being here today. I look forward to uh, having this, those folks, those visitors to our community, and hopefully spend a lot of money here. Absolutely. <laughs> we like to shop. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. And uh, Madam Clerk, next item, please. New business. Item B. A resolution adopting the International Building Code 2012 edition. <clears throat> Recognize Tom Stoltz, our Director of Metropolitan Area Building and Construction Department. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman and Commission. Uh, Tom Stoltz, Director of the Metropolitan Area Building and Construction Department here today uh, to discuss the adoption of the new commercial building codes uh, for Wichita Sedgwick County jurisdiction. Uh, as you recall, um, last month I was here for a public meeting to discuss the code adoption uh, uh, for this uh, commercial building code. Uh, we are, uh, we have historically uh, within the last year or so adopted new trade and residential building codes and we are now similarly looking to adopt 2012 international building codes here today. Over the last year and a half staff members and uh, members of the Wichita Area Builders Association along with commercial builders and design professionals have been reviewing the local commercial building code together so that a reasonable and best practice code can be adopted. These discussions were shared at four public meetings attended by builders, architects, engineers, and developers. And the code adoption with amendments was passed by the Building Codes and Standards Advisory Board by an 8-0 vote in their January meeting. And finally, this code was presented to the Commission last month at public meeting. Like other government jurisdictions around the country, Sedgwick County has historically adopted local building codes from recognized national and international organizations. Members of these organizations are industry experts in the fields of residential and commercial building construction, and the code line guidelines that they produce every three years generally are viewed as best practice for the construction industry nationwide. <clears throat> as I previously mentioned, there are several reasons to adopt new code in uh, this jurisdiction. First and foremost, it represents a way to enhance public safety for our citizens through best practice application regarding designs and construction of homes and commercial buildings. And it also helps to keep building insurance rate at the lowest possible level. Secondly, it helps to ensure basic consistency of building practices between jurisdictional lines in consideration to building professionals who operate in and around Wichita Sedgwick County. And finally, it serves to achieve consistent and fair operational protocol for building professionals who are licensed and operating in Sedgwick County. There are two parts to the code adoption process. First, we have to do an extensive review of the incumbent code and compare it to what is being proposed by the new code. And secondly, we then have to discuss amendments which are local in nature and differ from the base code. These amendments serve to provide uh, several uh, benefits. First of all, they can give relief from regulation of the national code, which we decide that don't make sense for this local jurisdiction. Secondly, they cover the adoption of the local trade codes, such as Uniform Plumbing Code or the National Electric Code that we choose to adopt here locally. They reference ADA standards, which are enforced in the state of Kansas, and they connect to local fire code related matters directly involving the state Kansas Fire Marshal's Office the Wichita Fire Department, and Sedgwick County Fire District Number 1. Many of the amendments being reviewed today are carryovers from previous code cycles. However, there are some that we discussed in detail at the public meeting held last month. Specifically, uh, Section 10 of the resolution today, which deals with when permits are required in this jurisdiction. The code calls for building permit to be pulled when a structure reaches 120 square feet or greater. For several cycles in Wichita and Sedgwick County jurisdictions, this number was amended to say 200 square feet. During the public hearing, we discussed the possibility of increasing that number even more. After discussion with staff, we have increased this number to 400 square feet before requiring a permit in unincorporated county. We will still keep it at 200 square feet in the city of Wichita. We also corrected section 10 to reflect that no location permit is required in county jurisdiction, but is still required in the city of Wichita jurisdiction, and we also removed the anchoring requirements for structures built in an incorporated county. 
Section 32 of the resolution which deals with fire sprinkler requirements for A2 classified structures was discussed. A2 assembly buildings are commonly built structures for restaurants and nightclubs or food service industry. The new code calls for sprinkler systems to be installed in all new construction of this type when the fire area exceeds 5,000 square feet or when the occupancy will rise above 100 people. Historically, the City of Wichita Code Department allowed for an exception to this code which allowed an occupancy of 300 people. When the code departments merged in 2013, this exception was carried over to the Unified Code. The proposed amendment today continues to allow the 300 occupancy number, but it requires the builder to add a third exit or fire alarm system to the building. Thus, the new amendment proposed today is less restrictive than the 2012 code, but more restrictive than the previous amendment. This proposal was a compromise between fire officials and local builders and developers, and after further discussion with staff and with commission after the public meeting, uh, we have kept this amendment the same for today's resolution. Sections 27 and 35. Similar to these amendments were developed in partnership between builders and Wichita Fire Code officials. Both of these amendments address large-scale storage facilities, most notably pertaining to aircraft hangars. The 2012 code calls for a sprinkler or fire suppression system when the building reaches 12,000 square feet in size. Historically, the City of Wichita Code Department allowed an exception for aircraft storage buildings to reach as much as 26,000 square feet before requiring a sprinkler system. When the Code Departments merged in 2013, this exception was carried over to the Unified Code. The new amendment today is a compromise between the old amendment and the new code, allowing storage areas of this nature to be built at 18,000 square feet before a sprinkler system is required. After consultation with officials from Sedgwick County Fire District No. 1, these current amendments were to be specific to the City of Wichita jurisdiction only. County Fire Jurisdiction wished to continue to adopt the 2012 Building Code as its standard. After last month's public meeting, it was clear that a majority of the Commission expressed an interest in keeping this amendment language consistent between County and City jurisdiction, and today's resolution will reflect that. So the, the resolution today states 18,000 square feet. Section 37 of the resolution was brought up by commissioners during the public hearing. Essentially, this proposed amendment requires that emergency egress openings have to be 48 inches high in addition to the 30 square inches required by code. This is an amendment that had been in previous code and is supported by Wichita Fire and Fire District 1 officials. Since the discussion of the public meeting last week, I have again talked with fire, fire officials from both city and county jurisdictions. The amendment was originally adopted after fire officials proved through simulation that the 48 inch height is needed for the safe extraction of people from a building or the safe entrance into that building by fire officers wearing breathing apparatus. The city of Derby has adopted the same amendment into their local code ordinances. We have left the amendment in place for today's consideration and for further discussion. Uh, at this point, I think that I know there will be other questions. I want to conclude my comments and stand for any questions that you may have. And County Fire Marshal is here with me today, and uh, Mr. Ladd, who's the Assistant Director of MABCD, is here also to help me answer any technical questions. So, well, thank Mr. you. Mr. Stoltz, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, first thing I might notice is on, on the slide that's on the screen right this minute, the last statement, Section 37, I believe according to my paperwork here, it should be Section 36 for the openings. Is that correct? I'm seeing in my backup material here, looks like it's section 36 for the egress. Let me openings. double check that, Chairman. Um, Commissioner Ranzaw. You're yep. correct, sir. That is section 36. 36. Okay. Mistake on the you. slide. Uh, Tom, I just want to clarify a couple of things. First, on, on this uh, hangar, right now, the code in the county says 26,000 square feet. The, the unified code says 26,000 square feet. And that's, that's been right. in effect for how long? Since the unification of the code departments in 2012. 2012. So the last four years, it's been 26,000. Now we want to lower that to 18,000. That's correct. Have we and I might qualify that. The 26,000 has always been an amendment in the city of Wichita jurisdiction. Okay. It hasn't been in the Cedric County. When we amended or when we unified the departments in 2012-2013, that, that amendment got brought over. So, so it has been in the county since 2012 to that's be 26,000, and we want to lower it. That's correct. And let me, um, and then back on section 32, could you clarify for me, 
Fire speaker requirements. What's required now? You, the, go back and say again, it's more respected, less respective than, okay. than what? The, first of all, this deals with assembly two occupancy. So these are buildings which are, uh, by code definition, are restaurants, nightclubs, or food establishments, generally speaking. The code calls for a uh, fire sprinkler system to be added when the fire area reaches over 5,000 square feet or when you decide you want to have, as a business owner, more than 100 people in the establishment. That triggers the need for the fire sprinkler. Historically, in the city of Wichita, that amendment, uh, the amendment existed which would allow that number to go from 100 to 300 occupancy. So you have 5,000 square feet of fire area and you could have up to 300 people. The 2012 code wants that number to be 100, so fire marshal in the city met with a lot of business owners and they were averse to that restriction, so they worked out the compromise that if they put in the third exit, and a fire or a fire alarm system, they could continue to have their occupancy at 300 people. So this amendment historically has existed in the city of Wichita, it did not exist in Sedgwick County until the unification of the code departments in 2012. And so what we're proposing today, or what uh, the fire marshals are proposing, is that we have this compromise exist so that we can get people out of the building if it starts on fire, that's the need for the third exit, or the early warning alarm system to let people know that an incident has happened, which will get people out of the building faster in lieu of the fire sprinkler system. Okay, so, f but for years we've allowed up to 300 in the city. Yeah, for at least 10 years. For at least 10 years. Several cycles, Now yes. we're going to make it more restrictive. Correct, yes sir. Okay. Same with you. Okay, that's that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stoltz, on, <clears throat> on um, section 39, I don't, think, I don't think you talked about this during the slide presentation, but I section 39 on st standpipe, mm -hmm. I read in the backup material, it sounds to me like standpipe systems <clears throat> are required if the, it says as if the floor level of the highest story is 20 feet above the lowest level of the fire department vehicle. <coughs> in other words, so when the, when the, when the fire truck pulls up, the, where the tires are sitting, that's, that's where it's measured from, I assume. That's, I think that's Elevation. correct. I might ask the fire marshal to come up and hit okay. the standpipe topic, Dan, if you want to. If you don't mind, I'd just like to get a better explanation of this. Good morning, Commissioners. Dan Wagner, Central County Fire District, number one. How can I help you? Well, on the standpipe um, regulation that's being proposed here, <clears throat> trying to understand what it says. And so, it's talking about the, the lowest level of the fire department vehicle access. And that would be. So I don't know what that means. Is that talking about the building entrance, or is that that'd be the roadway where we have our the vehicles roadway. at? Yeah. So if the roadway, the ground, surface, the ground level of the building, so measures that the, is measures the floor le to the floor level of the highest story. To if it's more than twenty feet, then a standpipe system must be installed. That's what this is saying. Yes, sir. Okay. So I was misunderstanding you when I read this earlier about access to the standpipe system. This is whether the standpipe system is needed or not needed. This would this would trigger the need for a standpipe system. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and of course, in the city, it's 30 feet. In the county, it's 20 feet being proposed by this regulation. Can you explain why we need something that's, that's 10 feet shorter than the city? Operationally, we operate on the floor below the fire floor. So if we're in a third three-story building, we don't have a standpipe system in that building. This code would get us a standpipe and get us water on that second floor where we can establish our water f supply, give us a place of safe refuge, and conduct our fire attacks on the third floor of that building. Um, in the Cedric County, we have fewer resources and a longer distance to these buildings. So if we've got an apartment complex that's three stories tall and we've got a fire on the third floor, this allows our crews to be able to operate safely quicker and get water to the scene in a better means. You, what you just said a minute ago is basically response times are longer because we've got a, we've got a very large jurisdiction. Right. The distance between lines. our fire stations is, is larger than what it would be in the city, so it takes us longer to get resources to that scene. And when we've got to pull, pull hose from the trucks to the third floor, it takes time. It takes manpower, and this, this allows us to do this quicker, more effectively, and safer. Um, all right, I think I understand that one now. I'm going to continue thinking about this. Commissioner Peter John? Well, thank you. If I can jump back, I, I want to make sure, and, uh, and uh, if 
Fire Marshal Legner, if you can, uh, you or, or Tom can uh, uh, help me out in terms of, I want to make sure I understand, will the, the square footage provision, if we're at 18,000 square feet, uh, will that be different from the city of Wichita will remain at 26,000? Uh, section 27 and 35? 18,000 across the board, sir, city and county jurisdiction. 18,000 for both city and county. So yes, sir. It would be a level that would be the same for both. Correct. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Right, Commissioner Ranzo? Yeah, I have some more questions about the standpipe height. <clears throat> what, what, what does the code say now? 30 feet. 30 feet. And it's been that way for how long? Since 12, to 12 adoption. We, we amended it to 20 feet when we adopted the 2012 fire code. So when we adopted the 2012, we lowered it from 30 to 20 feet. So we've been in effect since 2013. But before that, it was 30 feet. Yes, sir. And the city can do it at 30 feet. Yes, sir. Okay. And the, thank you. And clarify, back on the hangar thing, we're going to go to 18,000, but this, that means the city is actually lowering its threshold from 26,000 down to 18,000. Correct, sir. Okay, thank you. Can you, um, can we go through this list real quickly? You talked about, we talked yesterday about uh, what are the sections being proposed that are more strict or more restrict okay, so more restrictive of of the code that's a change this year mm -hmm. can you highlight those items as sure. you go through this list the, the and there's a list of um, you know we have 70 amendments here right and, and in within that is a, a small number of restrictions that are deemed more restrictive than the than the code that's being proposed uh, section 25 which deals with um, door width required um, that Cedric County and Wichita and the state of Kansas have adopted ADA code as the standard. The building code often refers to what's known as ANSI standard, which is American National Standard Institute, and sometimes the numbers for accessibility are slightly different. So, for example, in section 25, the 28 inch standard, which is listed in code, is an ANSI standard. ADA code requires door widths to be 32 inches wide to accommodate wheelchair access, to more accommodate wheelchair access. And so just the fact that we've adopted ADA in Cedric County, we're, we're straight across ADA in the city of Wichita, we have what's called ADA Plus, which we discussed about a year ago. Um, anytime that we see reference in code, which is ANSI standard accessibility requirements, which are different than ADA, we automatically go in and grab the ADA numbers. That's the case in section 25. And while I'm on that topic, that's the case in section 47, same issue, size of doors in I3 occupancies, which are generally uh, jails or custodial type facilities. That number went from 28 to 38, uh, 32 inches, same way ADA. Uh, landings at doors, section 49, more restrictive. The ANSI standards are 44 inches. It's a landing outside of a doorway. And the ADA standards are 48 inches. Okay. Um, another more restrictive uh, uh, amendment being proposed that we haven't talked about yet is section 43 which is the requirement of fire horns and strobes to the at the connecting point for the fire departments outside of buildings the code requires that that be clearly marked and i might ask the marshal to come up if there's further question on this the horns and strobe are required in this jurisdiction to make it more visible so if there are trees or other natural uh, devices in the way that the fire department can clearly see when they're rolling in where to hook and connect their equipment. So in this jurisdiction, um, um, that's an additional uh, requirement. You say the word connecting, what do you mean by the word connecting um, to what? Uh, the fire hydrant or? Yeah, uh, the, to the actual building. 
Oh, connect to the building itself. So they actually get the water. Yes, from sir. They've got a fire department connection in the building to augment the sprinkler system in okay. there. So the the strobe just gives us a, a visual cue to say, hey, right below here, this is where we hook up to it. This is part of the fire alarm system that's in the building already. Yes, sir. So it's yeah. just basically the horns. Uh, the horn strobes combination only activates if we have an activation of the alarm or the sprinkler system. And just for clarity, is this a new requirement this in this adoption of the 2012, or is this something that's been in place before now? This has been in place before. Okay, yeah, and that really is my question on, on really all of these. Is it, it, what, what are these things we're talking about that are that are new, more you know, more restrictive this year uh, in this proposal? Again, so this is one of those things that's been around for at least a little while. Yes, sir. It's not new, but uh, it's good to know what we're more restrictive when we've had some history with this. It's uh, the sprinkler system. Uh, the code requires that they use a water gong. One of the problems with the water gongs is they get birds building nests in them. They don't always function. Um, and they're expensive. Um, actually, a horn strobe system, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but are a little bit less expensive than the horn gong thing. So we have it both a visual and audio cue that we've got an event going on in the building, and we know where the fire department connections are. That does make sense. OK, well, thank you for that explanation. Yes, Please continue. I think. I have one more question. Let me go ahead and stop for just a moment, Mr. Stoltz and Commissioner okay. Ranzal. Uh, let me clarify on this the standpipe thing. It's right now it's 20, but what what is the national standard recommend? The, the code that we're adopting, 2012 IBC, is 30 feet. It's 30 feet. So yes, we're sir. being more restrictive than what the code, the national standard code, recommends. We're, yes. Okay. That's that's what I want. Thank you. I think that might be all um, section 69 prohibited doors uh, this is more of a this has to do with elevator doors and this is language which allows um, buildings with elevators to put uh, fire rated doors on the outside of the elevators um, actually was talking to the fire marshal before uh, the meeting he would be okay exempting Sedgwick County from that if the commission would be okay with that. We would keep that standard in the city of Wichita jurisdiction, but um, we could take that restriction away. What, what number is that? Section 69, prohibited doors. When, when you build a, a building that requires, or you have elevators in it, there is a lobby required. And in some buildings, that is not feasible. So this is a alternative for buildings that cannot have a lobby through structural design. And it allows them to put fire rated doors in and automatically closing doors in the event of a fire. So it's actually an additional option for those types of buildings, not necessarily a requirement. It is more restrictive because you'd have to add the door if you don't have the lobby area. But if you have the elevator lobby area, then this does not apply. This is a little bit complex, but it is still a more restrictive requirement if, if uh, you don't have a lobby. And just for clarity, is this a, is this a new, uh, new idea for this This is adoption? new, sir. Yes, it's new in this So you're, you're telling me, just to, again, for clar clarity, our, our fire experts here are not necessarily opposing the idea of us not, not making this change. Our county fire expert the is county, saying that. County fire I, our city fire expert is not here, and I think they would... I think we'd like to probably keep this in the city jurisdiction. Yeah. I, okay. So I, I anticipate some interest in probably not adopting Section 69 change. Very good. Um, so let's let's put that on our list of things to talk about here in just a moment. But can, can I clarify? Uh, Commissioner Ranzoff, please continue. Okay, but th that's an attempt to give another option. Correct, sir. Right. To yes. people. Yes. Well, is there a way to give another? option I like options is there a way to give option that's not as that's not less restrictive not that not that we discussed during our public meetings with the developers and not that the fire the city fire marshal okay. could come up with okay going through this list uh, um, I'm trying to figure out which items are are uh, which things are more restrictive that are new this year? And again, I'm not exactly sure if I can. I think of all that. of the more restrictive of the half a dozen or so amendments that we have listed that are more restrictive, there really is only one that's new, and that's Section 69. Okay. I think the rest of these are carryovers. 
I think that when we have discussions, well, I know that when we had public meetings, and I know when we talk with fire staff, just because we carry something over doesn't mean we shouldn't scrutinize it if it's more restrictive. And we have been pretty vigilant in looking at that. The marshals, city and county, and the developers want to keep some of those more restrictive items, and, and we bring them forward to you then for, for uh, discussion. So, um, but most of these are carry, all of them except one, sir, are, that I can see are carry over. Back to the uh, standpipe um, regulation. I understand the I understand I understand the explanation that was given, but I'm, I'm wondering that, you know when Wichita Fire Department shows up to a building that's higher than 20 feet, they've got to pull hose up to that higher level. It takes them a certain amount of time to do that, and if the building is is engulfed in flames, it's not safe to do that. They're not going to uh, they're um, not going to make an attempt to put out that fire. They're going to attack that fire from someplace a little further away or, or whatever. They're going to put themselves in danger. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we get to the building and it's and it's because it takes us, a lo us longer to get there, our response time is a little bit longer because of the type of uh, area that we have to cover. Um, seems to me that that would still be the same thought when you re when you get on when you get on scene. If that fires uh, get to the point where things are not safe to do so, you're not going to you're, you're going to have the same thought process that the WP or WFD has. And so I'm not sure I understand the reason as to why. I'm still struggling with as to why our, ours would be different than the city's. We have the same hose. They don't have any equipment that we don't have, do they? We have the no, same the, equipment on the equipment and stuff's the same. Is is okay. just a logistics address? Um, you know, of course, you know, if the building's totally involved, we're not going to go in there. But if we've right. got a a single room that's involved in fire, and we can go in there and make an interior attack, this is, allows us to establish our water supply where we need to have it established. Okay, and I and I do I do understand that. I think that's. That's correct. I, 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 I accept your your explanation. That does make sense to me. But I, why would why would WFD and Sedgwick County need to be different, though? Can you explain why, other than response time? But when you get on scene, your 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 decision process is exactly the same. I would think. It Once is. you're on scene, you're, it is. So whether there's a standpipe or not a standpipe, I guess I don't see why they would have a different standard than what we would have. And if they're following the the national the national standard. And it's okay in 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 the city, and it's been this way in in the, in the county for in, in our history. Um, why would we want to take a more restrictive? We just looked at it that with the development uh, going around uh, Wichita, or, or actually in Sedgwick County, we're having more hotels and more taller buildings. Uh, up until recently, we really didn't have you know three and four story buildings to contend with. Um, as we're building more of these, we we're addressing the. The issues and from a logistics and tactics point from us this this makes sense for our department to make us more effective in how we do our jobs so that's that's why the change but if they're three and four story buildings they're going to be over 30 feet yeah and that's already in place I'm talking about the three-story buildings where we currently don't have a, a standpipe system <laughs> in it so you want the current buildings that don't have one to get to go no back and put one no in. they're there any new construction it comes into play if the building's already in existence we, we don't make people come back and put them in but if they're a three-story building they're going to be bigger than 30 feet yes if they're a two-story building they're probably going to be bigger than 30 well feet. they're at the they're at the 20 foot mark so it's the two stories earlier you talked about a well 30, if a you're looking at 12 if you're looking at 12 foot for a story uh -huh. okay it, it it comes into play when we add the third story into the building so we're talking in a, a three-story building because currently at the 30 foot it'd be a 36 foot building which doesn't necessarily require it either let me let me interject so a, a two-story building the floor of the second story is about roughly say 12 13 14 feet above the ground yes sir so that that is not going to be a problem on a two-story building right three-story building it would be Right. It, because it's probably going to be in an area that's say 25, 26, 27 square feet, or 26 or 27 feet off the off the ground. So that would trigger in our in our case if we adopted this as proposed, that would that would trigger a standpipe requirement. Correct. In the county, but in, in the, the city, county. of course, they would have to go to the fourth story before it triggers. Would, before it would trigger this, because then it would be you know something above 30 feet, something like 35, 37, 38 square uh, yes. uh, feet in uh, elevation. So the four story building, regardless, would always have this city or county. As is proposed, the three-story building in the county would require this, and would probably not re and would not require it in the city, assuming that the that the, the 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 feet per story is approximately 12 or 13 feet per story. Okay? Yes, that as, is as four crosses yeah. and that type of thing. Okay. Um, 
do we have a I'm, I'm thinking about around the county where do we have a lot of buildings out there that are this third story i mean i'm trying to think of you know, there's not near, a lot. near the city of wichita certainly no no right. question there but but we've added some a few apartment complexes and stuff and, and apartment complexes are seem to be built more um and again there there's some sprinkler requirements that come into this so th it's it's not going to be applied very often but in in the cases that a it is going to be required it would trigger it is that considered a commercial building if it's yes. an apartment complex Interesting. yes okay so multifamily. Com commissioner peter john well, thank you i i'd like to ask a broader question just so i make sure i i know we're looking at this code strictly for the county for the unincorporated areas but i do know that our building inspection folks sometimes are contracted out to do inspections in particularly third class cities and i was wondering if um if the codes that they'd be inspecting to would uh, in, in this case, probably follow the county code or something else. Yes, sir. A great question, Commissioner. Uh, there's actually three things going on here. There's our building department covers Wichita City and Cedric County, and there are nine class two and three cities that also have an MOU with MABC that provide services for that city. So when we adopt things and we say, Cedric County jurisdiction only that would incorporate the class two and three cities as well and the city of Wichita would be separate and distinct by itself um, Section 10 that we altered says unincorporated county Regarding the 400 square feet of uh, before a building permit is required the the No longer requiring the anchoring unincorporated county only so in our class two and three cities unless I hear from those city officials I will keep that at 200 square feet which has been the history that we've been adopting from cycle to cycle so that's a good question generally by and large you are correct when we say Sedgwick County we are bringing in the class two and three cities who have an MOU with our department but there are specific times and the and the building permit requirement is a great example of that which will only involve unincorporated cedric county well then we've had a lot of discussion about the standpipe and how that would fit would would they have their own provisions or would they fall under the county or city or it, it would vary by it would the anybody that's covered by cedric county fire district number one would have the 20-foot requirement so okay. if they're building a building in that jurisdiction that marshall wagner's department covers we would require the 20-foot well, let, let me ask you then, we've got a number of second and third class cities that are in the fire district. Are those primarily the ones that are covered under, the, we've got 20 in, incorporated jurisdictions entirely or partially in Sedgwick County. And you say we've got nine that are fall into the second and third class. Are, are all these second and third class, the nine, within the boundaries of the fire district or is it it's a mixture? It's, it's gonna be a mixture. I know for example, um, Colwich, we have an MOU with Colwich, but I know they have, they their, have own their own volunteer fire. fire department, so that wouldn't be in District 1. But by and large, I think that is true. Most of these Class 2 and 3 cities are within Fire District Number 1. Well, because my, my concern has been to try and have a level playing field within Sedgwick County so that if we are looking at develop, developing a property or uh, mm -hmm. someone's trying to grab their piece of the American dream and build a building, uh, we've got a level playing field between jurisdictions as much as we can and that's why I very much appreciate my colleagues questions and in terms of trying to understand how we can try and create that level playing field for all the participants and uh, not put us at not put one jurisdiction or another at a competitive disadvantage or uh, an unfair advantage and uh, and that's why uh, I, I'm raising the questions that I have today and I appreciate the answers from both the fire department as well as uh, yourself, Tom, and, and the other MABCD folks who are here. Thank you. Not to uh, not to uh, um, wear you out, uh, Mr. Stoltz. I'm oh, sorry. I got for a repeated warning, question sorry. here. But, uh, section 39. Section 39. I'm sorry. Section 69. Once again, 69 uh, regarding the uh, extra door option. As this is currently written, the the extra door extra doors near the elevator. Would be prohibited, and we're talking about if we deleted 60, if we if we took out these changes to 69, then they would be allowed. Is that what we're, is that am I, or do I have that backwards? You might have it backwards. The this amendment deals with uh, elevator doors, and the differences here are elevator doors that want to have additional um, fire protected doors, which and it be, then spells out 
the automation that those doors need. The automatic closing device shall be limited to an approved magnetic hold open device, et cetera, et cetera. It begins to give specifics on how those are to be built. As Commissioner Ranzar brought up before, this is not required if you have elevator lobby. Not required. You can put them in. It's free world. You can put them in if you so desire, and this will give you the specifications on how to do that legally. Um, for those buildings that don't have a lobby, this would be required. These types of fire closure doors with all of this instruction on how to properly do it would be what our inspectors would look for when they go out to look at the building. So if we did not adopt this change, it would give us a little more freedom to, to find a gives us other options if we did not adopt this change. We could look for other options. In our discussion this time around, during this cycle, during our meeting with developers and during our meeting specifically with Wichita fire officials, there, we could not, there was not any other options. But if, if you want county fire to be excluded from this, I think we can and I think the marshal and I could sit down and look for other options to hit what you guys want to hit, which is let's give people options as they build these buildings to do it safely and within code. Yeah. Mr. Ranzo? Couldn't you allow the same door with or without a lobby? To me, that's the easy way. You, you, if you don't have a lobby, then it's incumbent upon the building owner, the building designer, to put a fire suppression system in to where smoke won't go up the shaft, uh, that the doors will open, uh, that that the elevator will come down when a fire event happens and that fire officials can get in the door. There's a lot of things that happen to elevators during a fire emergency event. And this particular piece of the code requires that door to be installed, that fire protection piece of that door to be installed if a lobby does not exist. The lobby gives protection. Um, and if a lobby cannot be there, then this gives a bona fide option for people to put extra doors in to give the protection that will keep the building safe. Almost need fire marshals up here to talk about this one. This is it's a busy amendment. What constitutes a lobby? I mean, is there some? How, how would you? How do you know if it's a lobby or not a lobby? I mean, I go into a lot of that. buildings and sure. maybe you have to walk through come up and a door about. to get into an area where you wait for the elevator, um, or maybe it's just open to the rest of the. Space. Yes, go ahead. Bud Lett, MABCD. A lobby requirement would be an enclosure around where the elevator, the actual doors to the elevator open and shut to protect that area from smoke uh, penetrating through there, getting in that shaft and going up. Where it's not necessarily tied uh, to Commissioner Ramsau's question on the width of the doors. This is a protection, a way of protecting that shaft to keep the smoke out of there, which would be accomplished with an elevator lobby. So the lobby is an enclosed space. In other words, there's a, there's a wall and a door that separates that from the rest of the building. That's correct. And this, this <coughs> lobby, the doors to this lobby, are going to have these same requirements by by the code. They're going to have to have the smoke seals. They're going to have to have the automatic closing doors. I see. Okay. Well, thank you for that explanation. That mm -hmm. helps a little bit. So a lot of buildings I go to that have, you just walk from the front door of the building right to the elevator. That There is no lobby, obviously, in that case. If I, if I have to walk through a doorway inside the building, Correct. then that would constitute a lobby. Okay. So I... Most buildings I, I visit, I'm sure, probably are considered uh, buildings that don't have lobbies in that. Because Man, very, very rarely have I ever Epic seen Center, for example, has a lobby. You've been in the first floor of the Epic Center. The doors okay. coming in and going in protect the, the, separate the lobby from the rest of the first floor. I see. All right. Commissioners, um, yeah, but any other questions before we uh, take action here? What is the uh, commissioners? What's the will of the, what's the will of the board then? Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. if I may, I'd, I have uh, my my concern is making rules and regulations more restrictive than necessary, more restrictive than what the code says. And so, there's been some good things done on here. There's some of the things that I still have issues with. Um, I think I, I personally would like to see some changes, but I don't know where the other commissioners stand, and I don't know if we 
would be able to do that today or would want to do this at a later date I'm open to what are the other commissioners have to say but there's about four, four things that uh, I'd like to take a closer look at section 69 I've oscillated back and forth on this meeting I think I'd like to keep it because I think it is an attempt to give people more options I think I can make an argument you can make it even more flexible but if this from what I'm understanding it, it is an attempt to give them another option to do it if they don't have a lobby um, that's all I'll say may I Commissioner Ranzo may I ask okay section, section 69 I, I actually have some concerns about that myself section 39 the standpipe heights I have concerns about that and so I guess I would entertain a motion that would adopt the rest of the code if there's other sections you'd like to pull out of this uh, for our first motion we can uh, we can we can process these exceptions a number of ways we can either uh, handle them specifically as a separate item or we can uh, even defer those for a week or two until we understand these a little bit better which I think may not be a bad option um, but I'd like to see if we can drop as much of this as possible so again there's two sections at 69 and 39 that I would like to personally uh, have them uh, accepted from our initial uh, hopefully our initial option to adopt this code well I agree with 39 as well and I would I have some questions about section 32 and 35 as well but those would be the right. so for me four four areas that being said I do want to say I'm appreciative of the work that the uh, staff did with respect to section 10 I know we got some input from the public and they took a look at the, that and made some changes based upon that and uh, and I do appreciate the willingness to take a look at that mom okay. thank you I, I, let me also express appreciation I know this is a it's a tough process to go through this uh, a lot of details uh, to adopt a new code code standard in it and by the way I'm not sure if, if you said this or not but if you didn't let me just ask the question what, what is our current uh, standard now we have this is a 2012 code we're uh, considering right now we're in 2006 international building code and and just curiously is there a uh, is there efforts being done at, today to uh, develop I guess the next iteration of the code book that will we'll uh, 20, 2015 point? oh yeah they make them every three years just, yeah. 2015 has just been printed we're already starting review of that probably a year or so out before we come back to look at adoption there so again so we, we're actually jumping uh, six years almost to yeah, we're, two, we're jumping uh, a cycle skipping a cycle so again I, I just want to say thank you I know this is a very difficult process to go through all the the uh, the complex descriptions of all the I mean a lot of different uh, topics in here so I want to just really say I appreciate you and, and your staff and others that have worked very hard to bring us a, a very concise summary of things we really need to know about to do this because we're not experts uh, we, we lean on you guys to um, to really lead us on this I really, just really appreciate the good thank work you, that you all have done Commissioner Peter John well, thank you <clears throat> thank you uh, I was, <clears throat> if I can speak uh, clearly I'll tr try my best I think I've got a bit of a cold <clears throat> uh, I'd agree with the comments of uh, commissioners Ranzo and uh, Howell uh, just for question for Commissioner Ranzo he mentioned several sections I want to make sure that I've got them 32 35 39 and 69 is that correct yes okay um, I'd be willing to certainly willing to adopt this, this section and bring it up and we could pick these others uh, bring them up at, uh, at a later date I'm comfortable with that thank you uh, Commissioner Unruh thank you mr. chair uh, Tom, I also want to express appreciation for you and all the work that's gone on with all the partners and the um, tradespeople and the uh, experts in this field that uh, brought this recommendation to us. Uh, I'm inclined to, um, after hearing all the discussion, to be supportive of the uh, uh, <coughs> of this agenda item as it as it stands, and then amend it as we see um, necessary rather than hold out some pieces um, and I, I guess I'm just asking for your opinion is it, would you and and the folks who have to work with these prefer that we go ahead and pass this as you have presented it to us and then come back to you with amendments or would you rather delete these things and leave it I mean, or does it make any difference yeah you know, I'm comfortable with whatever the will of the Commission is uh, if we want to drill down on some of these 
it's easy to say we'll adopt everything as written and just take out those amendments for county jurisdiction. That's that's a simple fix. We can bring it back. We we can get that done. Bring it back even on consent agenda. And you guys can approve it. So I'm I'm comfortable with that if that's if that's what we're talking about today. Um, just taking out the amendments for the four uh, sections that were mentioned. Um, I'm comfortable if we want to adopt as is today and continue to drill down on these and come back at a future meeting and modify the amendments. I, I have no problem with that either. Whatever, whatever the commission desires. Okay, so there's no critical argument one way or another. No. All right. Thanks. To our staff, let me ask, um, what is the latest we can add something to the agenda for next week? Is it tomorrow or Friday? Man manager, do you know? Uh, we published the agenda, the, the final agenda, Friday morning, which means it goes to the printers Thursday. But we could delay that. So if we had something by 5 o'clock Thursday, we can get it on the agenda. Chairman, I might mention, I'm taking this same proposal to the City Council on April the 4th or 5th, whatever the Tuesday is of that first week of April. So if you would like, we could come back that Wednesday, which would, I think, April 5th is a Wednesday. I'd have to look at a calendar. But if you'd like, we could drill down and look at these further and bring it back well, for there a There is some advantage for us to deal with these before it's presented to the city. I mean, ideally, we would be asked all of our questions. Hopefully, you could present to them where we are, and they can certainly take that as That a, would be an advantage, yes. It would be better for us, I think, to have this done, if possible, uh, before you present this to the city. Okay. And uh, we do only have one more meeting left this month before you present this to the city. That would be next next week, the 23rd. Okay. And so I guess it would be my I would be my hope that we can work on this today and tomorrow. I would like to go ahead and uh, ask staff to add this to the, to the agenda for next week. And if we can't be ready for that, we can always uh, take action to defer it further. But I guess I'd like to try to uh, give our, our the commissioners a chance for them to ask questions and develop a, a, an opinion between now and tomorrow when it did that well I guess this assume this is going to assume that we can get this done next week add this to the agenda next week for these four items if we're not ready by then to take action then we can go ahead and just defer them further but I guess that would give us a chance to hopefully have this resolved uh, entirely before this is presented to the city I, I would prefer that if possible so okay. Commissioner Ranza uh, Mr. Chairman I will make a motion that we defer this for one week uh, Commissioner Reynolds, let me just ask a question quickly. Would it? Uh, let me ask Mr. Stoltz. Would it do any good for us to adopt this code with the, these four exceptions and then deal with the four exceptions next week, or does it matter just to defer the entire item till next week? I, I'm I'm good with either okay. way you choose, sir. Uh, uh, so, Commissioner Ranzo, your motion is to defer the entire item until until next uh, next week's meeting, and then and then hopefully we can take action at, at that time. Right. I just thought it would be cleaner if we, okay. if we want to approve everything except those four. That's fine. I think we end up at the same point, but this way it's it's all together because I think we're committed to getting it done by next week. If there's no advantage to doing it one way or the other, then I guess I get. I think we've honed, I think we've got it down to uh, um, the areas that we've got some concerns about that we can we can work on that. We will plan on taking this up again next week. So that is the motion. I second it. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? One thing I did not do, and I, I, I wish I would have done earlier, but let me ask the public, is there anybody out there that would like to speak to this item before we take any final action here? Okay. So our motion is to defer it till next week. We have a motion and a second. I see no further discussion. Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Commissioner Unruh. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Peter John. Aye. Commissioner Ranza. Aye. Chairman Howell. Aye. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much for the good discussion, and we will hopefully get that uh, completed next week. That's our goal. Madam Clerk, next item, please. New business, item C, report of the Board of Bids and Contracts regular meeting on March 10th, 2016. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Joe Thomas, Purchasing Director. Uh, the meeting of the Board of Bids and Contracts of March 10th uh, results in four items that we bring to you this morning. Item number one is River Sand for Public Works. Recommendation is to accept the low bid from Martin's Central Sand Company, uh, Incorporated and establish contract pricing for one year with two one-year options to renew. Item number two is bridge improvements for Public Works. This bridge is located on 45th Street North between Broadway and Hydraulic. The recommendation is to accept the bid from Claver Construction Company Incorporated in the amount of $480,782.75. 
Item number three is the 271 building renovations for facilities department. The recommendation is to accept the low bid including alternates from Commerce Construction Services Incorporated in the amount of $743,400. And our final item, item four, is for on-call plumbing services for facilities department. Recommendation is to accept the proposal from Commercial Trade Services, LLC, and establish contract pricing for one year with two one-year options to renew. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have, and, and I recommend approval of these items. Thank you, Mr. Thomas, for the presentation. Commissioner Peter John? I'm going to make a motion that we adopt uh, the recommendations of the board and bid, bids and contract. And uh, after the second, I've, I've got some, want to throw out some comments to item three. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Commissioner Peter John, you have further comments? Yes. I know there was a lot of work by county staff to, uh, on the building renovations at 271. And with a figure here of just under three quarters of a million dollars, I appreciate the hard work that uh, has been put into getting that and the fact that this is a number that uh, uh, is going to be well below a lot of the initial numbers that have been thrown out. And so I'm very pleased and going to be supportive of these four items today. But I wanted to draw some attention to item number three, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner, for those comments. And let me just, uh, I guess, again, I'm going to use round numbers, but in my, my recollection, our first our first presentation of the remodeling of this building was roughly a million dollars per floor. It was close to $6 million for the entire uh, building. And, um, and so what we've got right now is a, is a uh, much more affordable option. I, and I anticipate it's still going to be very nice. You're going to walk in, it's going to look like a nice building. And we'll yes. be very proud of it. So I'm thankful for the work that you have done and, and others to bring us a very uh, competitive bid. I do have some questions on item number two. I notice we only have a single, a single bid there. Can you, how do, how do we know that we have got a, a good offer, or a good, a good bid on this item? Can you talk about that just a little bit? I mean, this is 108% of the engineer's estimate, I see that, and they're allowed to let contracts with up to 110% of the engineer's estimate? Yes, sir. Um, are, we, are we confident we've got a good bid here? I mean, how do we know that? We had discussion with Public Works the other day, and we also made a, a reached out to the vendors who didn't quote on this project and what we ascertained was that uh, due to several major well, major project at uh, uh, Kellogg with the uh, several bridge uh, bridges being worked on at that at that at this time uh, many of them said they just did not have the crews to work on any future projects um, for at for the time being and then after talking to um, um, Mr. Spears and Mr. Weber we felt like this was a a competitive bid would you agree to that Jim? Yes. If I understand correctly, do we, we did, uh, I guess, uh, 16 companies, I guess, were for, cert for certain in were informed, I guess, of this opportunity and only one bid. And so I guess there's a lot of construction going on in Wichita, which, again, when you have cranes and cones, I guess that means that's good stuff for the community uh, at the end of the day. It's, it's, it's rough when you're trying to get around town, but uh, after it's all complete, it's pretty nice. Um, Commissioner Aranzo. Just along that same line, isn't our expectation that for the next few years, there's there's numerous projects being done around that are ongoing and that are going to be planned, that it may be that the the bids that come in for some of these projects for a number of years may be a little bit higher than, than what they have been recently. Is that our general expectation? We're going to struggle for a while, I think. Uh, I was driving out Kellogg yesterday. I counted nine cable cranes two hydraulics working within view of Kellogg. Every one of those cranes is a crew, so there's a lot there. KDOT has let the series of bridges up on uh, K96 um, that will fire up pretty soon. We've got all the stuff out on East Kellogg. Contractors are telling us that they've got some spots. It looks like this fall going into winter, uh, things may get better because the KDOT bid lettings will be done and known. And we've actually on a bid letting that we should have had Tuesday, we slid that one out two weeks and we've changed the timing of that project to let construction begin in the fall because we actually have contractors telling us that, you know, if we could get out to September, October, uh, they think it'll be, be better. But it's a tough thing. You know, we have to guess what the market's doing and we have to guess what the pricing is so these estimates are a little bit, they're a little tricky and we have to try to get them up high enough that we can cover it in 110%, but we don't 
we don't control them, we don't really know what's going on. As we see bids coming up, if we don't think we have enough people that have picked up plans, we're making phone calls. You know, did you see this one? Are you going to you know, take a shot at it? And they're telling us, a couple of them are literally saying, we're not bidding anything for the rest of the year. So um, we're going to struggle through this year. I'm hoping next year is, is better. Next year is better. Um, we'll see. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that explanation. And I, and I, I think it's, we are in a good position considering um, all that's going on. Um, we, we understand how supply and demand works, and right now there's a lot of, a lot of demand, and so um, the supply is not what it would have been without all that's going on around the community. But that's actually a good thing. I think our community has is, is seen a lot of investment by a lot of different uh, governing bodies, and the, the, the construction is just amazing what's going on around the community. It's not really not just the county doing a lot of work, but the city's doing a lot of work. And you know, KDOT's got some mm -hmm. very significant projects happening in our state on the turnpike and, and uh, our interstates around the city. So we've really got a lot going on. Commissioner Peter John? Well, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to just amplify on your, your remarks there because there's a lot of talk about infrastructure and spending on it. And I think uh, the 600 miles of county roads and the 580 some bridges I believe we have uh, 582 is what sticks in my mind but I'll, I'll defer if uh, 593 593 is our number today okay 593 it is uh, no argument from me on that uh, taken as a whole are in excellent shape and I think uh, for the state of Kansas uh, uh, we're in we're in good shape too and, and where we do have some problems and they're, they're being addressed and being worked and and you mentioned the project out there on West Kellogg uh, that's a hundred percent funded with county tax dollars uh, and I'm sorry on the local match portion is a hundred percent funded with county tax dollars there is state and federal money involved but that's uh, the local portion is entirely Sedgwick County so uh, I think it's important for folks to know whether they're looking at a county road or a county bridge or even in this case it's a uh, basically an interchange with an interstate highway and a major US highway uh, Sedgwick County is uh, definitely uh, spending significant resources uh, uh, in this area and uh, I, I wanted to point that out this morning thank you Thank you, Commissioner. Let me go just uh, one final comment for, before we vote. But uh, next week, the 23rd, we do have Kansas, uh, Trans Kansas Department of Transportation Secretary Mike King will be here to present to us what's really going on around the community and around really around the state. We'll have a chance to see, uh, I guess, a presentation and we'll have a chance to ask him questions. But there's going to be even a greater understanding, I think, of what's really going on around us and what the, what the bigger plans are. So well, we're looking forward to having him, him visit us next week to have a much more in-depth discussion and, and have maybe a deeper understanding of, what, of what's being done around our community. So uh, with that, uh, Madam Clerk, we have a motion and a second. Okay, we're ready for a vote. Commissioner Unruh. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Peter John. Aye. Commissioner Ranza. Aye. Chairman Howell. Aye. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, Madam Clerk, next item, please. Consent agenda. <clears throat> Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Ron Holt, Assistant County Manager. You have items D through N on the consent agenda. Recommend your approval. N. N. That's it. Delta through Nancy. If uh, Manager Scholes was here, he would say it that way. <laughs> Delta through Nancy. Okay. Um, November. November. Yeah, well, it was the Air Force versus yeah. Army. I guess you use different numbers. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, we have we were clear a, a D through N. And um, mine's March 11. Commissioners, what's the will of the board? I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Commissioner Unruh. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Peter John. Aye. Commissioner Ranza. Aye. Chairman Howell. Aye. Great. All right, Madam Clerk, next item, please. Public agenda. Do we have anybody that signed up to speak to the commission at this time? I don't think I see anybody. So we'll go ahead and go on to the next item, please. Legislative issues. All right, we have our Councilor John Von Atchen. Am I saying that correctly? Your last name is hard for me to say. It's hard for a lot of people to say, Chairman. 
<laughs> it uh, uh, John von Atch, an assistant county counselor. A few items today. Um, one of them was uh, we found out this morning is kind of gone away, but it, it warrants some discussion. Uh, Senate Bill 451 um, would have merged uh, Wichita State University and the Wichita Area Technical College uh, and created the Wichita State um, Technical College. Um, there's an actual more technical name for it, but that's the merger would have occurred. A similar merger has occurred um, previously between uh, Washburn and Washburn Tech. Um, Senate Bill 451 was very, it's very, it was a very different merger than the Washburn Washburn Tech one. Um, the uh, initial uh, proposal would have had uh, the WATC funds uh, be completely within the general funds of the university. Um, whereas the Washburn Washburn Tech ones um, remained in the post uh, secondary education fund, um, there was a substitute um, bill floated around that would have created an additional oversight over not only uh, the technical colleges but the community colleges as well that would have uh, worked in conjunction with the Board of Regents. Um, and I think that in large part is what, um, what killed. Uh, would killed the bill at this point um, from from what we've been told the most important um, aspect of this that was not taken into consideration and um, we did uh, address it through our lobbyists and, and directly with um, with Senator O'Donnell was that um, we have a significant investment with WATC uh, and with WSU and uh, we have both uh, tax dollars and uh, and buildings involved um, with the WATC and NCAT, um, and that uh, we were we were not going to be given a seat at the table in the approval of the merger, um, and so uh, we did raise the issue. We did inform them that um, you know this would be discussed today, and that um, uh, I would be asking the the board for the opinion on whether or not uh, we needed to intervene and ask for some sort of approval authority over the. Uh, over the merger itself, but uh, at this point, with the bill uh, apparently to have been to be dead, I don't think the issue is necessarily dead. It may not come up again this session. It may be in a future session, but I think now that the issue has been put out there, that that the legislature is aware that we have a significant investment, um, and that um, you know we should have a seat at the table when when a merger um, is brought up again. And uh, the merits of it, I mean, I think there's pros and cons. With, with the merger. Um, I think the primary thing is to ensure that those students who, um, you know, who aren't necessarily going to be university students, uh, who aren't getting, who aren't using WATC to get some of their general ed to then go on to the university, um, that, that when they're there for technical training, that they don't get swept up in, in the merger, uh, and that those opportunities are still available for those, for those students who um, are there to learn a trade as opposed to those who are there to get, um, you know, a full four-year college degree at some point. Um, so that, um, so that was that, that's out there. Um, it's it's. I always say, you know, bills die, concepts don't. So that concept is still out there. Um, may not come up again this session, but it, it is something that we did raise, and I thought it was important to raise so that, um, you know, we have an investment out there and. and and, and if we're going to divest ourselves of the investment, let course. me just tell you, as a, as a former legislator, that nothing's ever really dead in Topeka. There's about a, about a hundred different ways to kill a bill, but nothing's ever really dead. So uh, at this point in the session, you can I would not be surprised if they, if a floor amendment popped up that this thing would just be brought back to life immediately. So it's good that we uh, are having this discussion, and uh, at some point here, we probably need to have a little bit uh, further discussion on developing a, pos a position for Sedgwick County, and hopefully we can. Uh, educate the legislators on, on what we would like to see them do with this bill should this ever come back alive because this is our chance to, to act and react and we may not have that chance when this comes up on the floor so um, we, we'll go ahead and go through the other items here I suppose but we, we probably need to have a, a little bit more discussion about this uh, Senate Bill 451 before we're done here today. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Um, one of the things that was uh, tangential and, and, a, and a topic of discussion on my, at Monday staff meeting um, were House Bills 2568 and, 20, and uh, House, Bill, and 20, House Bill 2570. 2568 dealt with community colleges and 2570 dealt with technical colleges. Um, 
the bills would allow the governing bodies of those institutions to institute a two mil levy for a five year period. Um, now with the technical college I don't think is would be as much of a concern for us considering the board composition um, but it, it is out there. The one that's slightly more troubling would have been the uh, House Bill 2568. It involves satellite campuses of which we have three in Sedgwick County. Uh, Cali County, uh, Cali Community College, Butler Community College, Hutchinson Community College have satellite campuses in Sedgwick County. Now, I'm, I know the board um, is, is aware of how those governing bodies are, you know, uh, are, com are comprised and how they're um, put together, but the public may not know, because we don't have one here, that um, in, in the counties where those main campuses are located, those trustees are voted on by the public. And um, those, those positions are elected. The bill would allow those elected officials in other counties to institute a two mil levy on Sedgwick County residents for, for, you know, for people they did not vote on and for a tax that um, they did not vote on. Um, and with three of those institutions here in Sedgwick County, you're talking the possibility of an additional six mills for a period of five years. and the purpose of which is to either, you know, to acquire real estate and build it and build it a campus, or to uh, acquire a building and remodel it for that purpose. Um, and it would require, you know, that if that if that governing body voted to do so, that uh, the electors would have to scramble to get a petition together within 60 days to put it up for public vote, which is. Um, even at a 5% number is significantly difficult to do. Um, so th that's an issue of concern and a little bit counterintuitive considering um, all of the legislature's current efforts to have the electors have greater say and there's a more accountability in, in raising of taxes and this one would seem to be a little less so. John, let me interrupt you for just a minute. When you, when you said 5% uh, I may just miss the point. So the electors would have a petition with 5% of the electors signing that, which would trigger what? Which would trigger a, a general or special election f for th for the the county in which the mill levy is proposed to occur for the electors to have a vote on that mill levy. So that's a, that is a, that is an, that's an, a proposed amendment to this bill? or is it That is actually in the bill. It's already in the bill. But it would not, for example, um, bring the issue before you know, before the Board of County Commissioners in the county where it's proposed, it would require that the electors put together a petition. So for them to oppose this would require them to be successful in getting the petition and having the vote and then then basically over overruling that. But there is a default that if they don't if the electors don't do that successfully, then the default is that it's approved. That it's approved. I see. Okay. Before we go on, Commissioner Peter John has a comment. Yes, I, I wanted to make sure first uh, you said Cowley Hutchison and the third community uh, Butler. Butler. Okay. And let me understand this, if, if, if we're talking about a petition, um, if they basically wanted to impose a two mil levy, would they impose it in their home county as well as in Sedgwick, or would they, Im could they impose it in Sedgwick without imposing it in, in their home county, whether it's Butler, Cowley, or Reno counties? The, the purpose of the bill is to allow those institutions with satellite camp campuses to impose a mill levy in the county where the satellite campus is located, not in not in the not a a sister tax in the county where the institution is primarily located. So, for example, if if and not to pick on one, but if Butler were to do this, the Butler um, the Butler Community College Board of Trustees would institute a two mill levy on Sedgwick County residents, but not on Butler County residents. Well, I. This isn't a hard call for me. I think we need to be in adamant opposition for several different reasons. I mean, I'll go back to the taxation without representation on their board. Uh, I also cite the fact that uh, uh, this petition provision is a joke. I mean, 5% uh, of all the registered voters to, to force a tax referendum. Any and all property tax increases ought to be voted upon by the people. and. Uh, 
to have legislation, this is an affront to common sense, in my opinion, uh, for this type of bill. The other thing is a little bit of history. Um, these satellite campuses for community colleges, when community colleges started to get it, were, were being created back in the 20th century, uh, there were provisions to keep them out of the counties where regents institutions were located. Now, there's six counties that have regents institutions. I could go through them here, but for purposes of time, I know that's of a concern to some folks. I won't. But just to say that uh, if the community colleges want to expand into Sedgwick County, that, that wasn't the intent to have them do so. Uh, I know they've kind of got their nose under the tent a couple different ways, and that's part of the history. But the idea that we'd have uh, a third party outside our jurisdiction imposing property taxes on us from the legislature, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm appalled that this that the, the, all ideas may continue to exist up in Topeka, but this is this is so beyond the pale that uh, um, it it needs to be strenuously opposed at all levels. <clears throat> and just for the record, to get to give folks some idea out there who may be following Sedgwick County government, we are deeply involved in the in, in with technical education. Uh, WATC NCAT wouldn't exist without Sedgwick County's contribution. We're over four million dollars a year in funding. Now most of it's to pay for the buildings, but ten of the eleven members on the WATC NCAT board, one's appointed by the members of this county commission, one's appointed by a member of the Wichita City Council because we are on city land on a 50-year land lease, and the other nine are all appointed by the county manager. So uh, the county is up to its eyeballs on this issue and will be for uh, as long as we have these, this area of structure and the board is fully responsible, if, if there is some sort of an emerger and the board for WATC NCAT becomes advisory underneath WSU, which is one of the ideas that's been tossed out, that may change. But for this current commission at this time under current law, we are deeply involved with WATC NCAT, and that's why we've got to focus very closely on changes in that operation, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Ranzall? Yeah, I just want to say I agree with my uh, fellow colleagues. Don't we have a legislative agenda item that says we support vote approval for tax increases? Yes, that's on our leg uh, legislative uh, platform. Right, and I think for that very issue, we should oppose these. And I agree with what Commissioner Peter John said. All, all tax increases, all levels should be uh, voted on by the people. And I appreciate you, you bringing this to our attention, John. Uh, John, real quickly, on, on House Bill 2570, we, we've, we've talked about 6, 2568, I guess, at length on this mill levy idea, but 2570, can you please explain that quickly one more time, please? It, 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 is, um, it is almost identical, except it's technical colleges okay. rather than community colleges, and, te and actually technical colleges that are in the county in which the mill levy is proposed, and the, uh, the boards of those technical colleges would um, have the authority to do the same exact thing, to mill levy up to five years for essentially for capital improvement projects, um, and then the same provisions regarding um, if if uh, if the electors uh, once once that intention is published, if the electors uh, wish to put it to a vote, they've got to have petition five percent. Do, do we know whether, whether revenue generated by a, a mill levy that, that they would impose does all of that revenue go to the school that that made the decision, or is there some of that shared by the the regents get involved in and in, in share some of that money with any other schools? Do we know? The bill does not indicate that any of that money. It, it is it it the the way the bill reads is that is it it is an intended to and I think with, obviously with the technical college is not as not as big an issue because they're already you know in that county. But with the community colleges, it it you know it establish a larger footprint. It seems like there almost would be an incentive for schools anywhere in the state to to set up a office here in Sedgwick County because they could essentially impose potentially impose another two mil levy on our county residents and so it doesn't require any type of uh, uh, of it doesn't describe how much operation they have in the county for them to do. I mean, every one of these colleges has a, has a a college county or a college uh, seat if you will in, in some other community in uh, in their own counties but all of them have offices here it doesn't necessarily mean they do a lot of a lot of classes here necessarily but because they happen to have a, a satellite 
classroom, they, this, this qualifies them to potentially uh, invoke this two mil levy. Does it require any, any description on how much they're doing here in the county? It, it is essentially <laughs> described as a satellite campus, the definition of which is very amorphous. Wow. I wonder if our, I wonder if our, uh, our, our um, tech schools and, and uh, community colleges and would like to uh, set up satellites in other people's counties and exercise their option that way. But just a thought. Um, I, I think we ought to be opposed to both of these. I would like to, um, whatever time it's the right time, but have a, a commissioner's motion, I guess, to make that official, that we would be strenu strenuously opposed to both of these bills. Um, and, and hopefully we would be able to um, encourage the legislators not to not to support these. By the way, I have had some discussions with some of the legislators on this. It sounds like these bills have a fair amount of interest. So I, I don't know that I would think that these are not going to move forward. I, I'm, a little, I'm very concerned about them. And by the way, just if those three colleges alone, three um, community colleges exercise, that would be six mills put, potentially for our county. So it's all additive. It's not like it's limited to any one school, and they could all do it. Correct. Right. All right. Commissioner Unruh. Actually, Commissioner Peter John was next. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to, since you didn't quite make the motion, I'm going to make the motion that we come out in opposition to 2568 and 2570 in their current form. The idea that uh, we could have a, this is the equivalent of a 20% property tax increase on, equivalent on the Sedgwick County, uh, on, on Sedgwick County, on the Sedgwick County portion of the tax property tax bill, is just uh, is just a total outrage, and uh, uh, I'm very disappointed that this is even getting serious consideration up in Topeka. May I ask you to uh, add to your motion that you'd authorize the chairman, or the or the designees, and our our oh. lobbyists, and our staff to to uh, submit to submit testimony. Yeah, I have absolutely. I've, Appreciate the chairman's uh, amplification of my my motion. So we have a motion, second. and we have a second. Any Commissioner Unruh? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, John, yesterday in the staff meeting, you indicated that we didn't even know who the authors of this bill is. As as most nefarious things are in the legislature, they you know they come out as committee bills, and so they're they're the the authors of which I I, I find it interesting because the the two issues. 451 and, and these issues, there there can be a connection made because of the of the uh, of the in, you know the insertion of a potential substitute bill on 451 would have kept a lot of the technical college stuff in with the community colleges. So um, this I think they come from the same source, but I haven't identified which source that is. Well, I. The it's just totally absurd that this thing's even wasting ink to put it on a piece of paper. You know, one way you can test a theory is push it to its um, extreme conclusion. I suppose then the folks in favor of this would also vote in favor for Missouri imposing a tax on the state of Kansas. I believe you and I discussed that on Monday. That that would that, that it would be about a, the equivalent is yeah, if I mean, the Missouri just, Assembly if, did that to us. If you if you push the thing to the extreme, I mean, it just it is so it is so absurd. It's uh, it's almost maddening that they'd even be thinking about it. So I'll be supportive of the motion. Reminds me of the Boston Tea Party when Britain's trying to impose a tax on people across the ocean. So it's about the same idea. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the vote. Commissioner Unruh. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Peter John. Aye. Commissioner Ranza. Aye. Chairman Howell. Aye. We're still on legislative issues. Um, conversely, and then it's it's sometimes strange how these things happen. House Bill twenty seven nineteen um, would change a lot of things with some of the smaller taxing authorities. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, 79, 2925B and uh, elections with cities and counties regarding tax increases, but you know those things wouldn't necessarily trickle down to the smaller taxing authorities. Well, 2719 gets some of the really minute ones uh, into, into a little bit of focus where things like 
airport authorities and recreation commissions and um, uh, you know board of regents and municipal universities that one it would change the requirements that um, the governing bodies that created those um, it changes this shall to a may as far as mill levy funding um, for those and that you know to the extent that that they have the separate authority um, to impose a mill levy that that would go back to the authority that granted their existence for example the airport authority would have to then come back to you know and and, and ask permission <coughs> to uh, have a mill levy increase so um, it, it's it's a little bit of a furtherance of um, some of those um, those ideas put forth in things like Senate Bill 316 um, and it, it just seems to be a little bit opposite of what we just discussed which is there's a constriction there's an, there's an allowance that some but there's some some sort of oversight regarding um, either directly with the voters or through the governing body that created um, these smaller taxing authorities to to have some oversight, to have some, you know, have some say in whether or not those increases do occur. Um, so that that's a rel that's a that's a relatively new bill. Uh, I know some of the uh, smaller taxing authorities have contacted the clerk's office. Is like, what exactly does does this mean for us? So I've had some this conversation with the clerk's office about this particular bill, but I did want to uh, bring it to the board's attention that you know some of the discussions we've had about. Um, Senate Bill 316 and, and, the, and the House bills um, that that are all associated with that 7925B concept um, that that's being expanded not upwards towards the legislature but downwards towards the smaller taxing authorities. And then one last note: uh, Senate Bill 316 is scheduled for further discussion and possible final action tomorrow. Do we know whether House Bill 2609 has? Had any? It did have a hearing. Anything? Is there anything planned for that? Do we know? There, I have not heard anything further about the bill being worked. No further possible discussion. Um, I don't know that there's necessarily a race for one side or the other to get their bill uh, out there. But um, I suspect that something will come out of the committee tomorrow on Senate Bill 316. Okay. And just for the reminder for our listeners, Senate Bill 316 is, is being called the tax-led bill. It's a uh, cleanup bill that uh, just, I think, five of the exemptions <coughs> that are in the current uh, language that was passed last year. It also um, speeds up the implementation to 2016. And Sedgwick County uh, offered a, a, an amendment to this uh, last week, last Tuesday in Topeka. Uh, uh, Commissioner Peter John and myself t traveled there and offered um, testimony but our, our position is that the 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 concept of the of the language uh, is really something we would support however uh, we do need to have the option for an election I think municipalities have that right to to uh, ask their their constituents for the right to raise taxes above reasonable growth rates and so without without their permission they can raise it up to a threshold but beyond that threshold requires a, a, a vote which is currently not possible. So what we've done is we've offered an amendment that moves deadlines around that would make the uh, mail ballot election possible. So it's no longer a, a, a de facto lid, but simply voter empowerment is the way we would describe that. And furthermore, the implementation date, since we're already in 2016, uh, the base bill this year speeds it up from 2018 to 2016, which we, we believe is not workable. So we're, we're asking for a 2017 implementation date, which I think all of our um, all of our departments have said it does work for them and they're willing to uh, support the 2017 implementation date. We, we can certainly support that logistically. So we think that's the right answer there. So we've, we out offered these ideas and it sounds to me like that this is something that the, the, uh, the committee seemed to be very favorable to when we were there. So I anticipate those, those changes being adopted. Um, let me further say, uh, I know our, our friends across the street, they, they have uh, asked for um, uh, reconstruction or or remodeling uh, costs to be calculated into the new construction and uh, I am personally supportive of that I'm not sure what the position of the board is here but I think that that's a reasonable um, uh, request and I think I'm I'm personally supportive of that and I talked to some of the legislators last week and the committee members um, as well as the 
the lobbyists, it sounds like there is uh, across the board acceptance of that idea. So there, I, I anticipate that will also be adopted uh, when they work the bill. Any other comments from commissioners on legislative issues? Um, with regard to Senate Bill 451, the merger bill, um, I guess my my uh, my hope is that we would develop a position. Uh, just um, one of the things I think that we ought to we ought to we ought to uh, have a position that says that um, should a merger um, proposal come forward uh, through through this bill, that Sedgwick County would have some abil some ability to approve that merger. Um, because we're invested in both WSU and WATC NCAT to the extent that we are, um, I think we ought to have some, some ability to understand the merger and, and be willing or have the right, I guess, to, to uh, I know right now the, 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 the language out there says the Higher Learning Commission is who, who approves mm -hmm. this, and so there's no governing body who has any say on this. It's, it's, even though this is our buildings, it's a tremendous investment by Sedgwick County. Every year I think we ought to have some say uh, especially from the perspective of WATC NCAT, I think that that gives us a, a right to um, to approve that merger. I think we ought to have that right. So I would like to see um, that be a position that we would take. To me, it's probably the most important to, important because the language that's going to be or the agreement that would be uh, developed by WATC and and N or WSU. Um, I want to I want to ensure that we provide the same similar access to the community in terms of cost of education and 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 admission standards so that uh, our community that has um, traditionally accessed this, this technical education will continue to be able to access this opportunity. I think that's my, my most important uh, part of this, but I want to ensure that that language is, is in place to protect that access to education. Uh, that's my concern. And as long as we see that in whatever language is developed, I, I, I think there may be Likely, we would approve that, but we we need to be assured that that would be something that's that's protected in the in the merger language. Commissioner Peter John, well, I agree with your comments. and would just point out if you add Sedgwick County taxpayers through Sedgwick County, uh, we've got one and a half mil dedicated mill levy that goes to Wichita State University, and when you add that with the funding for the principal and interest for WATC and CAT and the operational support that we provide. Um, my ballpark figure is we're talking about over $11 million or uh, between over two and a half, over two and a half, approaching three mills in terms of property tax support for those institutions in our community. So Sedgwick County is uh, involved in education in a very significant way. And so if there are changes coming down the line, uh, I, need, I think we need to be very proactive in this area and, and uh, appreciate the chairman's comments. So with that, um, if there's no further discussion, uh, I would, uh, if not right now, then, then in a future meeting, I would like us to, to consider uh, developing a position from the county that says that we, we would like to have some, some ability to approve the merger language before it's completed. Um, and, and as the bill is currently written, there is no, there's no approval required by us, even though it impacts us um, in a great way. Commissioners, I don't see any further discussion on legislative issues. Uh, thank you, Mr. Von Anchen. Appreciate your good thank you. briefing this morning. Madam Clerk, next, next item, please. Other. All right. Commissioners, do you have anything for other this morning? Uh, Commissioner Ranzal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make a few comments uh, about today's editorial uh, uh, that was called Stand Up to Intolerance and Hate. Now, some out there may question the sincerity of the Eagle ed editorial board in this regard, but uh, for, I, for one, uh, am optimistic that this may be a sign of change, a change to where we are more tolerant and have less hate towards others. Because there's not a lot of tolerance and love out there for a lot of people. Now, if you happen to be an illegal alien or an immigrant from Syria, then there's lots of love out there for you. But if you're an immigrant who came here legally into the United States, spent time and money to get here the appropriate way, and then is, has a trouble with illegal aliens getting a, a, a pass, there's not much love for you. 
If you're a hardworking American out there who has lost his job to an illegal alien or see, seen their wages lowered as, as a revolt of illegal immigration, there's not much love out there for you. There's not much tolerance. If you're an American who sees the targeting and of Christians in Middle East countries and Christians who are being raped and murdered because of their Christianity and you have concerns about the safety of your family as Syrian refugees are brought to America without any consultation from local or state officials. There's not much love and tolerance for you out there. If you're a taxpayer who is struggling to make ends meet and you want the government to live within its means and stop raising your taxes to pay for these ever-growing government interventions in our lives and you and you say something about that, there's not much love and tolerance for you out there. If you're an elected official who wants to stand up for his community and say, I have a concern about possible terrorist attacks in our community because we know that there are ongoing investigations and we should be aware there's not much love and tolerance for you out there. If you're a woman who comes before this commission that talks about female genital mutilation because you're concerned about what's going on in our community, there's not much love and tolerance for you. If you're someone who has a different viewpoint or you want to exercise your free speech in a lot of areas in academia, there's not a lot of tolerance and love for you. If you believe in Christian values, constitutional principles, core American values, and you express those values, there's not a lot of love and tolerance for you out there. Now, is there? So I will say to the Wichita Eagle and, and others, let's stand up to tolerance and hate no matter where it comes from. Let's be sincere in that and understand that people with different ideas and values aren't just a bunch of racist bigots. There are Americans who have honest concerns about a, a wide variety of issues that are going on in our community. And in what you're seeing, there's a lot of frustration in America because people won't listen. You have this establishment in both the left and the right and that includes much of the media and our universities, etc. They just want to call people names and say you're a racist and bigot for having any of these values or having any of these concerns. <clears throat> and they're not. They're hardworking Americans who have a difference of opinion. So if we truly want to, if the Wichita Eagle editorial board truly wants to stand up to intolerance and hate, and I hope they really do, that I would say the first step they need to take is take a look in the mirror. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Peter John. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hadn't planned to, to get into comments in today's newspaper. I was still celebrating the good feelings from a basketball game in my a state where I went to college in, in Dayton, Ohio, uh, last night. Um, but uh, uh, I let me begin this way by saying, you know, March 16th is an important day in American history. And I want to point out a few f important facts that have occurred on March 16th. It has some connection here to Wichita in a sense, and certainly a for our neighbors over in Reno County, even more so. A fellow by the name of Robert H. Goddard, on March 16, 1926, launched the first liquid fuel rocket at a farm, farm in Auburn, Massachusetts. Now, Goddard had been fascinated by H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds and uh, had tinkered around uh, in this area, but he came up with a rocket that uh, by current standards, it was really almost less impressive than some of the fireworks we have whenever there's a community celebration. It went only 60 miles an hour and only went 41 feet in the air, 
only landed 184 feet away. But pretty soon that idea that he grew into and the work that he continued until his death in 1945, uh, his work became the foundation for all of mankind's exploration into space. And of course, the Goddard uh, Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland was named in his honor. We also point out on March 16th that the United States Congress authorized the establishment of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point on this date in 1802. And interestingly enough, on March 16th, 1995, astronaut Norman Thagard became the first American to visit the Russian space station Mir. So March 16th is an important date in American history, and I wanted to get that on the record, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate uh, Commissioner Ranzo's remarks and would be uh, we'll, we'll save my comments for a, a later date uh, uh, because as a person who grew up in the, in the 20th century, I've seen a lot of hate and intolerance on college campuses in the 1960s and 70s. The Marxists, the Alinskyites of that era, were, were, they didn't have the power that they have now that they've kind of gone into positions of authority in, in the culture and in academia and in the media and many other places. Uh, but uh, it's uh, to quote the sage Yogi Berra when I see the hate and intolerance out in today's environment uh, and the fact that unfortunately people are getting killed I, there was certain atrocities that occurred in San Bernardino from Islamic jihadists who uh, unfortunately uh, uh, killed 14 people and injured many many more uh, in the words of Yogi Berra Unfortunately, it's deja vu all over again, and uh, and I'm, I just hope that uh, one of my responsibilities as an elected official is working to keep this community safe, and that remains a priority for me. So I'll just include my remarks in that on that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, let me just raise uh, another issue that uh, I, this is more information for the listeners on the television. I hope that uh, they will write this one down. As I look out in the audience today, I see more members of the media than I do see people from the community here. And, and one thing that I have wanted to do as commissioner um, since I've been here was to try, to try to move these meetings in such a way that we can actually um, invite the people from the community in a way that makes sense. Uh, we have our meetings typically on Wednesday mornings at 9 o'clock, but uh, a lot of folks that uh, would like to participate in our meetings or come and talk to commissioners or even see us face to face and have a a discussion with us are most many of them are at work and they can't be here um, so uh, one of the things I've done is I've asked uh, Commission staff and, and my colleagues to support the idea of having in district meetings in the evening and this, these are not going to happen all the time but we'll see a number of these throughout the year we're going to start the very first one will be uh, March excuse me April the 18th April the 18th it'll be in Derby at the Derby Welcome Center at 611 North Mulberry Road Suite 200, and if we're if familiar with familiar with Derby, that's uh, just a little bit west of the intersection of Kel uh, of uh, Madison and Rock Road, on the north side of the street. There's a nice facility there that has the Senior Center, the Welcome Center, and the Derby City City Building, all in one facility. So the Welcome Center is a nice large facility there in the middle of that. We're going to be meeting there. We'll have a meet and greet. It starts at 6 o'clock p.m. The commissioners hopefully will all be there, ready to talk to constituents and people who are interested in, in uh, meeting us face to face. We'll be there to talk about whatever is interesting to uh, people who will come. Of course, the meeting will begin officially at 6:30. We'll do. Uh, we'll conduct regular business at that meeting. Um, uh, of course, we're always interested in hearing from the community. They'll have the chance to speak to us on any issue that they find important. It'll be a, um, a public. Uh, public commentary option for people to sign up and, and address the commission staff so our commissioners um, with that said I want to make sure that this is uh, I'll probably talk about this every week from now until uh, until it happens just hopefully trying to get some air uh, get get some interest in this and hopefully people will, will write, write this on the calendars and we'll, we'll meet meet with us on uh, at these at these evening meetings and so first one will be again April the 18th at 6 o'clock p.m. is our meet and greet the meeting officially starts at 6 30 that will be at Derby at the Derby Welcome Center, 611 North Mulberry Road, Suite 200. So I'd encourage uh, uh, everyone throughout the community to hopefully come out to that meeting and visit, visit with you there. 
The other thing I wanted to bring up, um, again, there was some action this last week on the Law Enforcement Training Center. I only want to mention, the, I guess, just one point here, and that is, uh, you know, the, the Eagle editorial staff did write a, a, an editorial on this. I guess I wanted to answer just a couple quick questions. Number one, uh, we're committed to this as much as we ever have been in Sedgwick County. We just need to let the process work. Um, so we're going to, um, the bid board should hopefully op you know, open these bids and, de and deliberate on, on these options and make a recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners very soon. And when that's done, at some point, the Board of County Commissioners will also, in an open meeting, uh, receive that recommendation. We will also deliberate and hopefully reach a decision, uh, at which point we will work with the city to hopefully um, come to terms on all the, whatever that agreement might include. Um, there have been no decisions by the county commission as, as of this time, but we will certainly be doing that as soon as possible. Uh, having said that, we're just, I just want everyone to know that we're committed to this. Uh, the, the editorial staff makes a point that this has been an ongoing discussion or a need for 17 years. Um, we understand that. We are we're not pulling away. We're not going to kick this can down the road. We're going to we're going to uh, develop a solution that we think is best and hopefully uh, find a way to agree with the city on that. So that is coming up. We are committed to that as much as we ever have been. We did need to push the, the date back for the uh, deliberations on these proposals back to May 18th. So between now and May 18th is our current proposal that we will, uh, in fact, be able to reach a decision and hopefully agree with the city. And so that's where we're at on that. Um, so let's be encouraged. This is good news. Um, we're, we're doing our job and doing it in an open and transparent way. And we're going to lean forward to a solution. We're committed to that. Um, that's all I want to say about that. Um, commissioners, anything else that you'd like to raise before we dismiss today? Seeing none. Manager, is there anything else you want to raise? No, sir. I don't think we have a need for a fire district meeting or for an executive session. So with that, I think we are adjourned. See you next week. Thank you. <clears throat>